Hey everybody, my name is Michael Lingenfelter. I'm here with writer Remedy here bringing you an awesome conversation interview today with Is Ilsa Daly. Ilsa Daly. And uh, Ilsa Daly is the owner and creator of Black Dog Biomechanics. Um, this is something that is fascinating and grabbed my interest recently. So I reached out to her and uh, she agreed to come on the show today, but she started this Black Dog Biomechanics um, just last year, um, in 2019, she was combining her knowledge of writing and computer programming and maths to create a unique biomechanics system that can help all levels and abilities to improve their performance. So thank you so much, Ilsa, for coming on the show today. And I'm happy to have you. No worries. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, um, I was working with one of my clients and with each and every one of my clients, I go through an assessment process. And so, mm -hmm. um, because I'm not able to be hands-on with my remote clients, um, I have them perform um, some movement assessments as well as postural assessments and have them fill out some information. And she was like, do you want me to send in my biomechanics report? And I was like, what does that mean? Like, what? <laughs> what? I, I assume she was just going to maybe send some like, video of her writing and some critiques yeah. um but then she sent over this video which had this amazing um it's what is it a motion what what would you call it well it's um so more it's like kinematic so it's it's movement so it's kind of the same sort of technology as what they use in motion capture studios for movies Okay. except that it's um, modified so you can actually use it in the real world. You don't have to be in a studio, you know, in a room with like a thousand cameras. You can just use a single camera um, and it's, it's the same sort of thing. So you're capturing the motion of the rider and then you're translating that into breaking it down into individual movements. Mm. So how much you're tipping forward, how much you're leaning to one side, how much you're twisting shoulders. Um, and it's like I say, we just use a single video camera so you can see in every single frame how the rider is moving. Awesome. So what you get out of it is this 3D uh, model of the rider. Cool. And I think, I think the words aren't going to do it justice. So I'm going to pull up here um, a <laughs> screen. So um, can you see the screen right now? Yep. Awesome. So this is what we're talking about here. And this is kind of like a real time. Um, so talk us through a little bit about like what we're seeing here as far as the technology, maybe how you made this happen. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, so what you're seeing here is... Um, so that rider is wearing one of our jackets and on the back of those jackets are these chessboards and there's nothing like special about the chessboards. They're just a visual pattern printed onto so Corex, like a corrugated plastic. So it does crumple if you fall off. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then what we do is just film with using um, a regular camera. And then what we do is then feed it through our software. And that's where you get this sort of the, the magic and the maths happens. So those green and red and um, blue marks you can see on her back, that's not, that we're putting them on in, in the software. So those markers are just purely black and white. Mm. And so what we do is we get this video, we feed it through our software. And what the computer does is it finds where those chessboards are and then it works out, okay, given that the, where the chessboard is in the image, um, how is it likely to be positioned in actual 3D space? So you can tell that just because it's at a certain angle and certain position that in reality, the rider is tipping forwards. In this case, you know, her, she's dropping her right hip down and falling out through the left. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see things like how she's twisting her shoulders, um, how she's leaning to one side and all sorts. And so what we do here, because the system gives you a 3D model of the rider, obviously it's kind of hard to translate 3D into a video. So what we do here is just give the riders a side view, a top view, and a back view. So you can see all the critical things like, you know, how much you're tipping forward, whether your right shoulder is coming forward, for instance, um, or if you're sort of leaning to one side. Mm, that's wonderful. And what is this, what is this little, is this a, another, no, that's not that's a That's another that's... one on the back of the saddle. Okay. Um, so we don't actually use that one anymore. Okay. Um, but that was one of those, <laughs> because I found that people's saddles actually move quite a lot. Uh, so the whole idea was then to translate from how are you moving in relation to your saddle. Got it. Um, so that isn't something we really, we can do it. Um, but because people's saddles move so much, it kind of, it was a little bit too complex and it wasn't giving us any extra useful information. Mm -hmm. um, so the whole idea, so we can capture loads and loads of data with something like this. 
But what's really crucial is that we make the data relevant and important to what you're trying to achieve. Mm. So it does give you broad strokes of you are tipping forward by 10 degrees. What it doesn't tell you is it, you know, it's in your T2 or T1 vertebrae. So it gives you, um, it's a practical, pragmatic approach um, just to show you how you're moving. Got it. Got it. That's pretty awesome. And so um, what I love to see here is that um, for me, so this helped answer a lot of questions because from my perspective, what I always see with writers is that um, and human beings in general, we typically are, I use the word stuck, but stuck mm -hmm. in some sort of spinal rotation and lateral bend. Yeah. Um, which makes it very difficult to have symmetrical control on the horse. And so when I was looking mm -hmm. at my client's uh, video, I had already come up with um, what I had thought to be like, okay, well, her spine's rotated left and she's laterally collapsed or bent to the side. And yeah. so then I looked at the video and her videos were everything was right shoulder coming forward, yeah. and collapsing, the left side <laughs> hip being up, the right hip being down. And it was so cool to see this feedback visually on top of mm -hmm. the um the asymmetries that i was seeing off the saddle um yeah. being able to then see them in the saddle and then also having this as a tool to come back on a regular basis and see progress being made yes that is a big part of the ethos of this is it's a snapshot of how you were today and then it's just something that riders could do every few months to say, okay, so this is how I was back in, you know, January, but I've, you know, I've worked, I've worked with you, I've worked with physios and how am I now sort of thing. And you could track your progress because sometimes it could be quite difficult. So say for instance, a rider tips forward, they don't feel like they're tipping forwards. So the idea of this is it gives you feedback because obviously if you did know, if you knew you're tipping forward, you wouldn't do it. But when you put somebody in the proper position, they then feel like they're sitting way back here. Mm -hmm. So this gives them the feedback, you know, the positive feedback that actually, yes, it feels weird, but you're doing better. And then, you know, they go away and they work on it some more. And then I come back in a, you know, a few months or so. And then they, you know, they can check actually, yeah, okay. It now feels normal. Am I still tipping forwards or does my new position, is that what's better? Yes. Um, so that's, you know, so it's, it's, you can track your progress. It's making it quantifiable to so putting numbers to it. But again, in a way that makes sense and is useful rather than just collecting tons and tons and tons of data, you can do that to the cows come home. But if it's not useful to somebody, then you're just wasting your time. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I think that's why I was so driven to it because I am such a visual and quantifiable mm -hmm. person that I saw this and I was like, ah, I got to have her on. I got to learn how I can get this because, um, I mean, I feel like this could be a missing point to a lot of uh, gaps that I'm looking to fill, others are looking to fill as well, because okay. I can go to a clinic and I can run assessments on people. Well, I can host a clinic and run assessments on people, find their imbalances, um, be able to give them things to do. But if you've got this amazing tool where they can visually see when they came in mm -hmm. and then you come in in another few months, you can check in again. Um, and this is going to allow, um, clinicians, coaches, trainers, writers to have that quantifiable, like you said, data that is important and not just gathering data to uh, gather data. Yeah. I mean, so I have a science background and it's so tempting to do that because you love the look of the graphs and everything like that. And it's great to have the graphs, but they've got to make sense and they've got to be something that you could then, okay, so what does that mean? And how does that relate to my writing yeah. and how does it help me? Yeah. Um, so the, as long with the videos, we also have a report that then cuts it down. It says on average, you are, you know, tipping forward by 10 degrees. Um, and then you also have the videos that shows particular movements. So in the video you showed on the website, you can see that the rider has a, a full on twist in her pelvis as she comes down and she sort of falls down, twists forward as she sits down in her rise. And so you kind of need the video to capture the whole, whole 3D sort of movement with time as well as that report can you know, show you snapshots of on average you're doing this. So it's important to have the two things, I think. Yeah, because the moment in time can be such a, um, it can be information, but that moment in time doesn't tell necessarily the whole picture of what's yeah. going on throughout the entire ride. And one thing, I, I didn't pull that up just because I didn't wanna put my all my <laughs> clients' data out there, but I, I got the full report and yeah. it was amazing because I gotta see her, um, I got to see the report and her moving in trot and canter yeah. to the left, to the right. So yeah. you get to see like, okay, well, 
from my understanding, I can see already before she gets on the horse, she is going to be again rotated and collapsed, which is going to make certain things more difficult. But then you mm -hmm. get to learn like, okay, where does that get exposed and what gates yeah. more does that get exposed? And, and certainly um, the, the canter being in the asymmetrical movement, you know, it starts on the outside hind leg. Mm -hmm. And so it tends to push riders one way more than the other. So on the, you know, on, on the right rein, it pushes them to the right and the left rein pushes them to there. So depending on their asymmetry, one rein's going to be much harder. Mm -hmm. And also that, you know, it, it impacts all levels. So some people have trouble getting the counter transition. And then other people, you know, I see often riders having a slight asymmetry and they're riding quite high level. And I'll say, I'm having trouble with one of my changes. And you can generally predict which change it is that they have trouble with just from that, just from, you know, if they sit slightly more to the right, mm -hmm. they're going to find it harder to lift that inside right hip up to get the change. So it's, it's things like that. It's really nice how it all sort of comes together and you can say, oh, okay, so that's probably because of this. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah. it's not always that simple. No. Horses and humans, but, you know, yeah. quite a lot of it does come down to, to that sort of just something that's quite simple. It's difficult to remedy sometimes, but. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, I, yeah. I agree. It is something that like, for me, if I look at someone that is, collapse laterally they are um, collapsing in one side from my background and knowledge i'm like okay well i understand that can be a weakness in the spine that can be a weakness in the hips it can be a weakness in the in the shoulder what mm -hmm. have you injured in the past what have you overused what have you been doing like there's 10 theories we're going to come up with yeah. but the cool thing is that when we make progress through trying to improve different areas of the body when we see change in the position in the saddle, then that is showing that maybe we're on the right track. So this is a yeah. tool to check in with. Um, so that way we can see like, okay, are these theories because yeah. you're going to, you're going to potentially collapse or be have a asymmetry because of a lot of things. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. if I've got pain or something going on in my hip, it could have been caused by years of having a cruddy ankle. Like there's, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, this is, I think, gonna be a very invaluable tool. And unfortunately, you're not in the States right now. Um, so you <laughs> do, you do um, clinics though in like, in privates and where, where are yeah. you based? How are you running your business right now? Well, uh, right now I'm locked down. <laughs> yes. We so are. I'm not running anything right now. Yeah. But the normal plan is that um, I arrange clinics with, with yards or I go to a certain venue and have people come to me. And we run, I either run one-to-one uh, -one sessions or two people in a session because sometimes people like to have a friend in with them, which is absolutely fine. Um, and so we do an initial assessment, um, look at the results, do a bit of coaching based on those results to try and fix things. Some things that are tipping forward, generally you can help improve that in session. But some things, you know, like that rider in, in the video on the website, that's not something you're necessarily going to be able to fix within 20 minutes of coaching. Mm -hmm. But you can sort of highlight his, okay, so here's what needs to be worked on. And then, so yes, yeah, so we do the coaching and then we do the final assessment so that riders can hopefully see progress they've made or again, just back up. Okay, so we've, you know, we've improved this, but we've still got that big twist in the pelvis. Mm -hmm. You maybe want to consider seeing, you know, a physiotherapist or an osteopath or, you, so that sort of thing. So it's, it's working with somebody's part of a sort of a holistic approach of the whole picture. And the other thing that's quite nice is that we spend a lot of time training our horses and not so much time training ourselves. And we kind of forget that that takes two to tango and there are two of us <laughs> that are involved in this partnership and you can train your horse until the cows come home. But if you can't lift that inside right hip up, you're not going to get the right flying change. It's just not going to happen. And so I think it's important sometimes to take a step back and say, okay, today I think we're going to have a look at what I'm doing and then go back to what the horse is doing. Yeah. You're uh, preaching to the choir there. Um... <laughs> because it's something that I've learned being in this industry and um, having conversations with people and realizing that um, a lot of people put everything else in their life first um, before doing things to make improvements in their self. Um, yeah. But having this understanding that, okay, you're two athletes working together. Um, it's only fair that if you're asking your horse to do so much that we've got to take a look in the mirror ourselves and figure out, okay, what am I doing to uh, make this a more positive um, mm -hmm. or potentially negative situation if I'm not doing the thing. So I appreciate that um, outlook. Yeah. Um, and so <clears throat> when when people are coming into you and working with you, 
how often um, are you seeing them as far as how much time in between to uh, potentially have and see make improvements? Um, it depends on it depends on the rider and the horse, really. Mm -hmm. I'd generally say on average it's about three months. Okay. So it's enough time to go away, to work on it, work with their normal coach, because this is something they do alongside the regular training. Um, and it's sort of something that complements it. So the idea is that, you know, you sort of work alongside and complement it all. So yeah, every sort of three months or so, that, that type of thing. And you're in the works right now of making this potentially available for yeah. uh, coaches and trainers. So how, what is that going to look like? It's going to look like, well, there's going to be two, two versions. So there's mm -hmm. one that's going to be a phone app so that then you can just use it like a quick snapshot of part of your normal training that you have with your regular trainer. Um, as I'm sure, you know, any trainers listening, sometimes you can tell your client that they're tipping forwards, but they don't feel it. They don't necessarily maybe take on board that information. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the idea is then that you can then sort of show, you know, evidence you're, okay, you're tipping forward. Let's just have a look. You know, just put the phone up, you do the video, it runs. Okay, so you're tipping forward by 10 degrees. Let's work on that. And so that's sort of the idea of the app is it just works into your normal training routine. And people can use it on their own as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be trainers, but I think the most productive way of, of doing it, the most useful way of doing it is as part of your regular training routine. Um, and then the other version will be sort of a, a broader, more like the version that I use when I run my clinics. For people who want to run clinics and want to do biomechanics, you know, that's what they do. So that'll be the full bells and whistles of you. You can run multiple videos and things like that. Awesome. And then is there for the app or the um, all bells and whistles, mm -hmm. are the riders going to be wearing jackets? Is that a part of it as well? Uh, for the time being, yes. But watch this space. The way that machine learning is going at the moment, it's just it's taking off to be able to do markerless tracking. Because obviously mm -hmm. that would be ideal. Like you didn't have to bother with getting jackets and things like that. I mean, it's, as it stands now, our jackets, I have three sizes, four sizes, um, and they pretty much fit everybody. Sometimes with teeny tiny children, we have to safety pin them, and I hardly ever stab anybody, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's fairly simple because as part of the video routine, we do a calibration to make sure that, that even if the markers sit slightly wonky on them for any reason, we sort of calibrate that out, so mm -hmm. none of that matters. So we put the rider in the perfect position, you know, I sort of have a walk around and make sure they're not sort of sat like this in the calibration. Um, and then that's their perfect position. Because mm. everybody, obviously everybody's body's put together slightly differently. And no matter how perfect you are putting the markers on, you know, if you were to put specific pointers on, yeah. it's going to be different for everyone. And so the idea behind this is, okay, it's a one size fits all or three sizes fits all, but it's, um, you do that calibration to take that into account. Got it. Yeah, because that was my thought is like, okay, yeah. you've got, like, ideally, I would just want to put it on the skin. That's cool. But yeah. that's <laughs> because you can get movement in the jacket. Um, yeah. So I was just curious how that would work with the remote um, aspect of this. So we have a remote system going on at the moment that's a sort of a, a step back version. So the remote system that we have um, is one of the old school versions where you stick markers on your shoulders and your elbows mm -hmm. and things like that. And it's a 2D version. It's mm -hmm. still useful. It still gives you the information, but what it doesn't give you is that full 3D picture of your upper body mm -hmm. and how that's moving. But that is something that people can do now. Um, yeah. I'm going to share the screen and have yeah. you talk through this because right yeah. now it's really cool. You, if you're wanting to get a taste of what this is, um, you can actually go and check this out and do a 2D version. Mm -hmm. And it looks like you can do it with, um, I, there's someone that's uh, jumping. So um, here's yeah. the screen for this. So what's going on here? So all I've done here is I've taken, I've actually not even, I haven't used anything high tech here. It's purely just a normal video camera. And what the rider has on, on her hat, her shoulder, hip, elbow, wrist, knee and heel and toes, is a piece of white electrical tape, just so it stands out from her uh -huh. dark clothing. And it doesn't have to be electrical tape, it's just that's convenient. It could be white sticky labels or anything like that. So the idea is that the rider then sticks that on themselves. Obviously at the time we're, you know, we're all on lockdown and also I'm in the UK, um, is that you can do this yourself. You can stick the markers on yourself and then you can set up your camera and do a ride past. You can either jump or do flat work. Um, and then you send me the videos and then I can run the analysis and you get a 2D analysis that tells you, you know, again, that you're tipping forward, that your lower leg is moving maybe too much. 
which is probably the most crucial thing in the jumping is that you want your lower leg to be stable. Mm. Pretty much anything else goes other than that. Dressage, obviously, there's a lot more rules. You have to be upright, you know, shoulder, hip, heel, and all of the things like that. But um, So it tells you, you know, how much your lower leg's moving, how much you're tipping forward, how much your hands are moving, mm -hmm. which is obviously a crucial one. Yeah, because you can see here that when I zoom in, you've got – it looks like it, it uh, goes from like joint to joint. So you can see yeah. the back movement, the femur movement, um, yeah. your kind of shin and then ain't a foot. And then you've got forearm, um, yeah. and arm hands, and head. head yeah. So you can really see um, what's going on at the uh, joint level and uh, how much either flexion or extension and movements there are mm -hmm. in the joints there, which is pretty cool to see. So obviously there's a bit of leeway here with this one because you're sticking markers on yourself or you're getting somebody else to do it. So there is a little bit of leeway, but again, it's still useful information. Yeah. Okay, so the you know the actual movement of your your actual joints may be slightly different, yeah. but again, practically it's not going to be a huge amount different from what you're going to see for this. Yeah, this is so going to be a question that I don't know because now I'm so I'm watching this video over and over, and yeah. I'm sure they have. Um, similar things that they put on horses to to track the stuff and to look at it um does anybody take a look at the two in relationship with each other like over time like if you saw a rider with um asymmetries and balances and then you've got this kind of software that's showing that on the rider but also on the horse and then being able to make changes with the rider if you see changes with the horse has anybody done no. anything sort of like that not really. Which is interesting about this ride that we're jumping here with, what you can't see is when I'm filming, I'm also standing next to her horse's physiotherapist. Okay. <laughs> so that is something we have talked about doing. Yeah. Because I think with the gait analysis with the horses, which I do have a gait analysis system, but I don't, I don't use it mm -hmm. because each horse is so different. It doesn't really give you that much useful information Got it. as far as I'm concerned as a one-off. Where it would give you useful information is an overtime analysis okay. and they're doing exactly what you're saying so it's a you know it's, it should be a longitudinal study mm -hmm. but it's making it practical to do that um and making again make you got to make the you can collect data forever but unless it's useful there's no point because i think this would be a very good answer to the question of does the horse create compensations in the rider? Does the rider create compensations in the horse? Yeah. And a longer study like that would allow you to potentially yeah. see a movement of rider or horse in a certain yes. direction. Most definitely. And also you have to include the saddle in that too. Yeah. That's You're... obviously the horse rider interface is that saddle. Brilliant. It's so important. Yeah. So um, that is great. Uh, there's so many directions. You just get your yeah. mind spinning. I'm sure you don't have <laughs> enough time in a day. <laughs> Um, well, I really, really appreciate you coming on here and explaining this um, with us. And I think, again, it's a very powerful tool. And um, people can go to blackdogbiomech.com. Yep. And you can go and do this remote biomechanics and mm -hmm. uh, check, check it out. Um, and then if you are in where uh, I know we're not obviously doing anything in um, in person right now, but when yeah. things get back to where we're involved, allowed to be face to face again, um, what areas do you typically um, work within? Well, all of all of the UK, but you know, I'd, I'd love to do some clinics in the states. My my family's from the states. I have a US passport, nice. <laughs> um, and I come over at least once a year, you know, to visit family and my gran and everything. So, you know, I'd love to do some clinics in the states. Cool. So well, we might have to make that happen. Then, drop me a line. <laughs> Cool. Well, um, thank you so much again, Ilsa. Is there anything else that I didn't ask you that would be really powerful for them to understand um, about your line of work, what you've seen, what you've learned, et cetera? No, well, I think, I think one thing to, to take away is when you see these videos and you, I think people initially may be a little bit put off either because they think, well, I, I just am a normal rider. Well, maybe this is too much for me. Or they think, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to open myself up to that much scrutiny. I think you've got to approach it in a really, yeah, sort of, um, this is going to be useful to everybody. There isn't a rider alive that doesn't have something and that can't help their horse by improving, even in a slight, you know, a little bit. And also the way that we run the clinics as well, you know, I make it fun. It's not scary. 
<laughs> you know, you have to come at it in a sort of a constructive but also light-hearted way. It's never going to be like, this is awful, that's terrible. It's always going to be like, okay, so this is good. You know, the report also highlights people that are, you know, doing well. Because sometimes I see some people that their main problem is that they think they're but worse than they actually are. And so they're so in their heads, I can't ride this horse, I'm not doing him justice. And actually, just to say, actually, hang on a second, the reports are color coded. And um, so you say, actually, most of this report is green. And then that can be as valuable as telling somebody that, you know, okay, this needs more work, as in to say, this is good. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's two sides of it. So, yes, we have to be, you know, critical and constructive and say, okay, this needs work. But also sometimes to say, this is good, keep up this good work. So I think. I think that also has to be said. Yeah. So don't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> don't be fearful. Cause at the end of the day, even if you're not too concerned with like your improvement or um, this is something that may show you how you can continue to uh, improve the health of your horse and keep yeah. your horse's health long-term by not oh, sure. being blind to potential um, compensations that we may be causing in our horse long-term. Yeah. You know, it's good to know if you're sitting too far to the right, it's going to affect your horse. So, you know, it's good from that point of view, even if you're just hacking, it yeah. still matters, especially if you're hacking. You know, I, I do see endurance riders, you know, and they don't really mind how the horse goes in terms of dressage. But yeah, it matters, definitely matters to them if they're sitting to the right, you know, for however many kilometers that they do. So I think it's useful for everyone. Absolutely. And even for, and I can, and I take this all the way off the saddle because that's my world. And it, I see riders who, um, are like, st again, stuck in some sort of um, compensation and they're putting five to six extra pounds through one side of their body on their foot. And you can imagine if you're doing that on one side for 10, 15, 20 years versus yeah. the other side, um, it can cause you a lot more wear and tear on one side. So yeah. um, this is this is great stuff. I appreciate your insight. I'm actually, I'm really, really excited to um, see how this is going to work out in the future and how we can incorporate this and um, to watch you grow as well. So um, thank you again so much for coming on and no I look forward to talking to you in the future. Brilliant. Thanks very much. My pleasure. All right.